Lou, welcome to The Outworker. Thank you for having me, man. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you uh, making the time. So you're known by all as being a very inspirational and motivational strength coach, but take me back to your earlier days when you were a football player and an athlete. You've talked about in the past how you know, you were trying to be a football player off the field as well, and that kind of had its setbacks. As much effort and time that athletics takes, why was it important for you to kind of break away from that one-dimensional identity of just being a football player? Um, I mean, it took a while. Like, I, I really grew up loving the game, and I, I mean, every year of my life, it felt like I was playing football, and then if we weren't, in season we were playing in the street or and I just carried over through high school where you know you got aggression naturally and you know you're growing up but if if you're around friends that are kind of into the wrong stuff too I mean most likely you will be as well so there was a lot of things that I did in my teenage years that I you know obviously I can't get back but now I have it as a platform to teach kids so like you know being an all-star on the field is great, but if you're not an all-star off the field, it's very challenging to, to keep that success on the field. So being a good person, um, not talking behind people, caring about your teammates, uh, you know, not giving up after you don't get your way. Like there's a lot of things or, or a mistake on the field, not keeping your head down. And I wasn't always the best at that when I played. I wasn't the guy that was uber positive on the team or – got everyone motivated you know I was more I was a little quieter um and I just believed in what I could do out there that was really my strength I guess but there's a lot I there's a lot more that I wish I did that I certainly understand a lot more now but I use all the stuff I didn't do I use every mistake I made I, I use you know all the stuff that was a negative back then into a positive now to help other people not have to do that same thing so I think it was uh, definitely a blessing and a curse, but more so a blessing because I can help so many others now. When you kind of got into that mindset of, hey, I got to stop being a football player off the field, was it kind of challenging at first, kind of breaking away from either friends or people that you hanged out with that you kind of realized, hey, these aren't people doing the right stuff off the field as well? Yeah, and honestly, if I, if I never met my wife, I don't know if I would have ever stopped. I mean, naturally, it just kind of happened because every break I got in college, I came home, and I wasn't just hanging out with the same guys anymore. Um, I was just hanging out with her. And that took me away from all the other stuff. You know, I, I just – I was more focused. I didn't get in trouble. I didn't, I didn't fight. I didn't – you know, there's so much more clarity in my life at that point. I was 19, 20, 21, that I just didn't want to let her down. So I I got more responsible, you know, and I was kind of embarrassed about some of the old stuff I did, thinking about, you know, what she would think of that. And um, But that helped me a lot because the sooner you get away from all that stuff that you don't need to be around, the sooner you'll get to where you want to be one day. Yeah, 100%. So you, you talk about in your book how – quitting can sometimes actually mean continuing down the same path. And that's something that really resonated with me. Just a little bit of feedback sort of on my end. You know, I used to work in real estate and I realized pretty quickly this isn't the career path or the path in life that I want to be on. And I kind of had that realization of if I keep going down this path, this is what kind of giving up and quitting is actually going to feel like. So getting into your story, into your college experience, why was transferring from West Virginia Wesleyan to Defiance such an important action to take, not just for your playing and athletic career, but kind of setting you setting yourself up for life as well? Yeah, no, I appreciate you diving and asking that. Um, when I went to college, I had a focus of, you know, get on the field early, you know, try to make an impact blah, blah, blah. You know, I knew I could do it, but I couldn't control the injuries that came, you know, like shin splints my first year kind of set me back. That was a red shirt. And then I started a tailback the next year, got hurt second play in my first start. Um, then the third year it was like, 
you know, I was getting promised all these things and none of those happened. So that year I was healthy, but I was hurt more than ever. And at that point I said, look, I'm either, I'm either like, I'm really going to be quitting if I stay here. Like, that's the truth. And I, I had so much ability in my own heart that I knew I could perform out there. I knew I could, you know, play the game the way I always did. And I knew certain players were getting playing time over me that I just didn't feel like they had the right to do that. So it was that, at that point in my life where if I, if I transferred, yes, it would be a risk. Yes. I would have to start all over. Yes. I have a friend group here and who knows what's going to happen there. Like all these things go through your mind when you make that choice. But if I stayed, I would have been quitting. So I, I left and I gave it time and I put the work in and it just didn't work out. So I think that's a, valuable lesson in itself to a lot of people that don't get their way right away and head out. That's not what I did. And and transferring back then, it didn't happen. You know, you didn't do that. So for me to do that and get dropped off in a freshman dorm when I was a junior in college, really a senior, because I had two more years to play. I mean, it was like, what am I doing? You know, like, oh my God, here we go again. But the fire in my heart to make it work at that point was undeniable like I was on such a mission to just play the game I love I didn't care where I was I didn't care what I had to do like I'm starting and this is gonna happen like there was a different mindset than when you go into college when you transfer it's like this is it man we got to make this work this is has to happen so I think that when that's your kind of urgency I think good things come from that and they did and you know everything happened I mean best friends for life I mean kid guys at my wedding uh, two-time all-conference, everything, captain, a team MVP. So if I never bet on myself, if I if I stayed, um, I would have never had that. How do you think that that process and sort of dealing with all that sort of mentally and emotionally kind of set you up and helped you sort of getting into your profession and career path of becoming a strength coach? You know, obviously, as you know, when you're a strength coach, you could be moving to many different colleges and, you know, meeting and trying to make an impact on new people and new teams. How do you think that that whole process set you up for your career down the line? Yeah. So when I transferred that, that is also when my career started. Um, cause I did two division one internships that in the summers that I went home, um, the years I played at defiance. And so when I graduated college undergrad, I had two D one internships all summer. So, Uh, that kind of gave me the network I needed to get a GA right away. And also like, yes, the moving in college definitely helped my mindset of the moving in my career and not getting your way and not stop believing. And that's, that's a tough lesson. I mean, you don't know if you're going to get another chance. Like I got my first head job in this career. I, you know, spent years as an assistant taking notes, trying to trying to learn, trying to understand like how I would do it one day. And then I felt like I had a good blueprint of how I would want to do it. And I got a chance and I did it and it was awesome and I loved it, but we were terrible at football. And, you know, you, you, you hop into a program, it's year five already, you're just in year one and you don't win enough and you're fired too. So like that happened to me twice in a row at two different schools. And the following year, I mean, I was about to just, I mean, my wife was so tired of it at that point. I was just like, man, this doesn't work out. I mean, I guess we can just figure something else out. And it's not fair to them. And that year I was named National Strength Coach of the Year and everything kind of blossomed a little bit. And um, But, <laughs> you know, with success too, you move. And I, you know, got a job offer at Georgia Tech and I didn't have to leave Buffalo and I did. And we moved again. And, So there's a lot that goes into it, but I do think the mindset early on definitely helped me. Yeah. Getting in, uh, getting into the perspective of your wife, actually a little, I I had seen an article from a while back now, I think it was when you were at North Texas and you were being interviewed and you said that you thought maybe you would just want to be a PE teacher, but your wife and girlfriend at the time said, you know, you can always be a PE teacher. Why don't you go after something a little bit more special? And one of my favorite quotes is, and I'm sure you know it as well, it's the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it's too low and we reach it. So I'm wondering, what do you think 
your life would look like if you never sort of took that jump or maybe if your wife had never said, hey, why don't you try to get into to this career pro- profession as a strength coach? It's a great question. And it's a question that continues too because I don't know if I would have made it this far either in this career if it wasn't for her perspective and her guidance and her belief in me too. And, you know, I mean, she's kind of the navigator of this whole thing as well, for sure. But I, I think, honestly, I laugh about it, but I probably, I mean, my plan was to just go be a high school football coach and PE teacher and demolish kids and dodgeball every day. And like, you know, that was my vision. I didn't have much, much higher visions than that. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so that really, when she said that, and I could get in at USF that first summer, I mean, my whole perspective changed. I'm like, wow, this is a career. Like I can actually try to do this for my life. I mean, I love football. I love working hard. This is amazing. So it really just fit. And I got lucky. She did, um, say that. What advice would you have for people who kind of maybe were in that sort of same position when they're young on in life and you're just like, maybe you're a hard worker Maybe you've got high energy like yourself, but you're just like, I have no idea sort of what's driving me or sort of, you know, what gets me up in the morning and energizes me. Yeah. So at first you can't chase the money. I mean, I feel like, you know, coming out of college, you could get like an accounting job or some kind of business job and it could pay you like 80 to 100 grand probably first. You get tricked by that number because like every day I come to work and I don't come to work, I come to do what I love. And it's like eventually the money will come if you continue on the journey and it's it's not pretty either but you know when you're passionate about something like when you when you like genuinely care about something it's probably going to shine in that building wherever you're at and then eventually you know things happen for you whether you get another opportunity somewhere else or someone calls for you or I mean, good things can happen when you really care about something and like you can't wait to get back the next day. So I would say take the chance, take the risk because it's early. And why not try something at first that makes complete sense to you rather than just kind of coast and go the safe route when you can always go back to that possibly if you need to. So that's that that would be what I say. 100 percent. 100%. Hundred percent. Yeah, I definitely. That's something that I definitely resonate with. And like I said earlier, I feel like that was kind of my mindset when I was right out of college, where I was like, "Let me take this real estate job, sort of get into the, you know, this corporate world of being on this straight path that I know where it could potentially take me in twenty years." But instead, hey, I'm you know twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five years old. Why don't I actually go after something else that? really drives and energizes me and something that I could say, this is what I'm going to spend my entire life doing. Um, so yeah, that's great advice. Um, so getting more so into sort of your day to day, sort of your football life. One of the things that I love that you do is you have your hunger board. So can you just explain for people who may not know what the hunger board is and sort of where that idea originally came from? Yeah, so when I was a GA at Mississippi State, my mentor, Matt Bayless, had this thing called the effort board. And we had, like, champion, average, and needs work category. Well, when I became a head strength coach, I loved the board. Like, it's all we met about. We tried to place guys in the right spot. And it was all opinion. You know, it was all, like, what we thought of the kid. And when I got a head job, I called it the, the hunger board. And I called it, you know, you could either be starving, hungry, or satisfied. And so same concept, just, you know, what kind of effort are they giving? Kind of same thing as the effort board, but are they starving? Are they hungry or are they satisfied? Do you, if you're satisfied, you know, you come in here, you might be a minute late. You don't care. Like you just kind of don't bring anything to the table. You might be overweight, but you don't have a desire to lose it. Like there, there's things that like you should care about and you don't. Then there's the hungry guys, the guys that are going to show up, they're going to do everything you ask, but they're probably not going to do any more. And then you got your starving guys, the guys you can't get out of here on the weekends, the the guys that are always doing extra field work, the guys that are always trying to ask you for more after we just gave you a lot. So like, those are the guys that kind of carry the program. 
And I feel like they take a sense of pride if they believe that you see that in them. So if it's placed every week on that board, like, oh, damn, they, they think I'm starving. Like, this, wow, okay, I got to keep this up. You know, it's just motivating. And, and if you're not, you know, you got to have a lot of conversations. Coach, what did I do to get satisfied? Coach, what did I do to be hungry? I thought I was, you know, I'm like, look, this is what we all said about you, and this is why. And it helps. There is a lot of feelings involved, and there's people that shut down. But I think the overall uh, goal of that board definitely works. Yeah, so – for mo- most of us who aren't on a sports team or aren't on a sports team anymore, who need to sort of have that internal sense of accountability, how do we make sure that we're honest with ourselves and sort of making sure that we're staying in that starving phase? You got to create a great routine for yourself. Like you have to write out your week. And if you don't do that, you're not going to do it. Like if, if you really set it up like on a calendar, I truly believe you can have an amazing week if you just write down on Monday, you're going to work out before you go to work. Um, You're going to do this at work. You're going to get this done when you go home. You're going to eat this then. You're going to like if if it's that important to you, write it down because anything I write down normally gets done. And if I don't, I won't. Yeah, 100 percent. You're sort of solidifying it as holding yourself accountable for it. So getting more so into sort of your coaching style and your coaching technique, it's easy for a coach or a manager or a boss or a parent or sort of anybody who sort of is managing people just to give orders or just to talk to them. But from listening you to you speak and your book, your book, you've made questions a pivotal part of your process whether it's your 25 interview questions to all the players that you coach or like you were saying in your book, how you had the 101 uh, questions that you printed out for Jabril Peppers when he was recovering from his injury. So the question that I have for you is, why is asking questions such a powerful tool to use to get the most out of people? Because nobody does it anymore. Nobody cares about it. Like they don't think about that. It's all about the program or do what I say or you know, get in or get out. Like who's sitting down for a month straight with a hundred kids and asking them 25 questions about their life. It takes time. Like it takes a lot of time and it's your whole afternoon after you coach the whole morning. Like it's very difficult, but it's so valuable. And you would, you would be shocked at some of the little questions you ask someone and how much they pour out because no one ever asks, no one cares. No one takes the time to listen to anyone anymore. And if they do, they don't really care about that answer. They just move on. So like hearing people tell you what they've been through and how they're even here and some of the tattoos they have and people that they've hated in their life as a coach, people that they've loved in their life, like that's valuable. That gives me a pulse on who's coming in here every day. So when I read body language, I kind of know why he's doing that. I kind of understand like where he's coming from more. So maybe I don't react so fast or maybe I don't judge him too quick because I know him. So it's just, I mean, I can't stress it enough as a coach. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite quotes from you is be real. Don't try to be this superhuman. That's the key to unlocking players potential. People relate and connect to struggling, not perfection. And the main takeaway that I feel like I get from all your work is you're building people and not just players. So the next question I have for you is, and I know you've mentioned him already, Dak Prescott, going back to the hunger board. I know he was on the hunger board as a freshman, which is impressive. When you see someone like that, who you've worked with, sort of come out and express their human and vulnerable side and you know say that they had mental health challenges especially you know he dealt with something very tough with you know the suicide of his brother how does that sort of make you reflect sort of on your work and sort of keep driving you to do what you do and sort of act as a confirmation that the way that you do go about your work is sort of the right way of doing it yeah i just i just believe in like sharing your mistakes i believe in you know, opening up your heart if you ever want your team to open up theirs. Like, I, I don't think it's necessary for you to tell everyone how great you always had it. Um, 
because these kids don't have it that great. They are going through stuff that is real. And I feel like the more you, you tell them of the things that did not go your way or the, the, the mistakes or regrets you have in your life, I mean, instantly their eyes are on you instantly because then it's not, you're not trying to like make them be something that they're being forced to do. You're just telling them that you feel for them or you are relating to them or they are relating to you. And that's how you get a relationship going. I mean, it's not, this isn't very hard. I just think people forget about it a lot. Like I'm going to tell people when I don't um, act a certain way that I should in my marriage or as a dad or when I was a football player, when I wish I had a different mindset at this point in my life, or it, it's so valuable to them because they're like, man, I'm going to be a dad, man, I'm going to be a husband. I, you know, I am a football player right now. Like, don't, don't live that same thing that I already did and I'm warning you about. And then, like, I, I truly believe vulnerability is like the key to leadership. Like, it, I don't care. Like, I'm not interested in all of your success, man. Like, I'm trying to get there one day, but I'm not interested in, like, you telling me how, like, awesome you are. No one relates to that. No one cares. Tell them the real stuff, man. And then bring them into your office and tell them how you had it, and this is what I had to do, and this is how I got through it. And then just be real with them. What do you think um, people's lack of being vulnerable, what do you think that stems from? they think it's weakness they think it's like you know show no weakness show no you know cr no crack in the ship right like nothing wrong with you like those are the days you connect the most yeah. they will always be the days you connect the most like that's why I do the workouts the players do every day like I'm not playing around I don't want I don't want to talk to you if I don't know how you feel I don't want to give you a message at the end of the day if I did not live what you're living right now so it's a big reason like be consistent do what they're doing feel what they're feeling then coach it like you know with passion because you already know what's coming yeah you've said that your role is more so than a coach it's you're being a constant psychologist life coach it's a constant friend brother enforcer disciplinarian and everything that goes into it so if you could change your coaching title to something that more fully encompasses that, what two words would you replace strength and conditioning with? Um, life coach. Yep, I would say life coach. You have a lot of responsibilities on your end, whether it's with your family or your team, but how does solitude kind of play a role in your life, especially when it comes to crafting your messages that you share with everyone yeah so i so at michigan when i was an assistant um my hobby became coming up with like my own quotes and i i like really tried to like create a drop down menu on words like discipline accountability toughness leadership and just come up with different concepts to to hit people with in a different way that maybe they never heard and it was always like it always happened when i was working out you know, I always, I always thought, thought the best when I was working out on my own in the dark, all this stuff going on. And that kind of carried over to my, my head strength coach journey. And they turned into messages after every lift, like every template I have for the lift, you know, you got your warm up, you got your explosive work, you got your upper body, your lower body, whatever you got your finisher, your competition. And then you got your message, you know, it's all part of it in my opinion, because you're not just shaping these kids' bodies, you're shaping their mind. And it just became a thing that I stuck to and I really enjoyed doing. And it would have helped me a lot if I had that more so as a player, just hearing perspective at the end of stuff. And then I walk out of there feeling different. You know, I think that's been my goal. It's not to, you know, I'll get you fast, I'll get you strong, I'll get you explosive, all that. But I want to, like, change your mind about certain things i want to help you like win an interview one day or you know be a good dad be a good husband and like care about other people you know respect people appreciate what they do for you maybe to make your life a little more convenient um but all in all i just think that's always been my hobby and then i created it into a book and it was just yeah it is what it is now do you know who um james clear is 
Yeah. So he has one of my favorite quotes, and I feel like it, it definitely resonates with me, and I feel like it would kind of resonate with you. Kind of what you're saying is, you know, you're not just trying to build players, you're trying to build people. People will, you know, forget the games, they'll forget the wins, the losses, the workouts, but they kind of remember the messages that you leave them with. And one of my favorite quotes from James Clear is, writing is one of the only ways to outlive yourself. People still read books from hundreds or even thousands of years ago. The author's physical life ended long ago, but their mental life remains alive and me- meaningful even today. Hearing that quote, how does that kind of make you feel? I mean, that's that's honestly like knowing that I have three kids and knowing that I've coached everywhere. Um, my ability to relate to people that I've lost touch with or my ability to inspire my kids as they grow and understand these messages more it did matter to me and I did want something to be out there forever because like I used to print out sheets at the end of the off season of every message I gave the kids and I handed it to them so they would have it forever but like once I started putting this thing together I'm just like man I really got to get this done because I think I think it can help a lot of coaches and I think it can help a lot of people in general if they just skim through it yeah 100 percent. i was listening to uh your podcast interview that you did with andy frisella and one of the main takeaways and the thing that stood out for me is that you said you know like you just said i you have three kids and that anything that you post you want them to be able to see one day and you always think about that and i think that's such a powerful tool within social media nowadays where i feel like when i was younger i would ask my you know, parents or be like, oh, like, you know, what were my grandparents like when they were younger? But I feel like with social media and kind of what you're doing, a kid could see that a kid, you know, a kid 20 years from now can see a video that you did, you know, right now and have an impact by it. Um, So yeah, it just goes to sort of that message of, you know, words have impact. And those words can be impactful for hundreds of years. Absolutely. I've always thought of it. I've always whether it was a video or just a post of words, they are always on my mind. Listen. Yeah, that's very that's very cool. And I mean, I don't I don't have a family, but that's even something that I thought of of, you know, if I have kids one day, whether it's, you know, twenty or thirty years from now, they can kind of see the videos that I was doing right now and sort of see, all right, who was my father like when he was, you know, my age. Yep. Um so getting into sort of more of your philosophy, obviously, as you know, the the name of this podcast is called The Outworker, and that's sort of outwork. That's kind of the word that I really resonate with, and what I always tell myself is, you know, your outworker status ends at the end of the day. It gets deleted, and you have to earn it back the next day. Can you talk to me about uh, your one-day contract in year one philosophy and why that's so important to have that mindset for developing a strong work ethic yeah so like there's a lot of people that you know want it all but they do nothing to earn it and you know I think you know everyone in this world will love a multi-year contract like I really believe that everyone would want that money uh, you know stability all this stuff right guaranteed but like if you don't work like you're on a one day contract today, I'm sorry, a multi-year is not coming. Like, and that's the majority of people. Some people get lucky, but like every day, if you were going to be hired or fired, like at the end of the day, if your work ethic alone was just being judged and you were either going to be hired or fired based on how you worked just that day, how much would your urgency level change? And if the answer is a lot, you're doing it wrong because right now I mean every day I coach you know some days things are going on in my life right I gotta try my best to mask up and give the kids everything I have and I'm not perfect right but I would say 99% of the time I am a hundred percent invested I am ready to go I am excited I am fun to be around I am motivated to get these kids better I am ready to change these kids minds if you're not and you want more it doesn't match 
Like, you just can't have both. So it's either make up your mind, work like you're on a one-day contract, or a multi-year will never be in your future. And then year one mentality, I always hear this, heading into year 16 of coaching, you know, year 17 on the horizon. Um, that's where I came up with the idea. I'm like, man, it's not year 17 for me right now. It's year one again. Like, I have learned so much this past year. I have met so many new people. I have gone through so many different scenarios that made me better and worse. Like, there's things that happened that I didn't handle well. But now I've learned from those, and I'm going to do it better this year. I've listened to so many podcasts. I've read so many books. I have, like, networked with all these different people. I'm going to put that to use this year. I'm going to I'm going to make it feel like year one again. I'm going to make that excitement grow and grow and grow. I can't wait to get to it. That's why I change the weight room around every year if I can. That's why I, you know, change the flow of workouts. That's why I change the partners they're with. I change the groups they're in. It's because I want to keep things fresh. I want to make sure like it's not just stale and nobody enjoys coming back. You know, I think that's important. And if you always think that you're heading into year one, I think it's a possibility. You're big on periods and commas. And you're saying stop putting periods in your life where God only has a comma. Hard, hard work pays off, but no one tells you when. So I want to play a little game with you called commas and periods. All right. So <laughs> Lou Corrala, fired twice in three years, comma, 2018 National Strength Coach of the Year, comma, Master Strength and Conditioning Coach in 2023. So my question for you is, and here's the game, what does Lou Corrala's life look like if you put a period after fired twice in three years? Hmm. Um, either fighting to own my own gym somewhere and that's it or you know be that PE coach I don't know I really don't know it's it's interesting I feel like a lot of the time and I you know I'm no different the roadblocks that we put up in our lives I feel like we naturally put them up and they sort of don't arise on their own I do think there is something to not having a plan B though like I really feel like when it was always plan A and that was the, all it was ever going to be, I feel like plan A will stay. I just, I don't know how sometimes, and sometimes there's droughts and sometimes there's really, really big doubts, but I just believe like if you truly believe in why you're doing something for the right reasons, I feel like the world's going to take care of that for you a little bit. Like it's not a straight line but I just plan A has just always been the plan and I, I don't know what I'd be doing honestly you know that, that's a that's a great mindset to have and I feel like what I tell myself is because I've obviously had setbacks in my own life and what I tell myself is you know there's no ups and downs it's just all part of the process it's that's, just that's a great I love that yeah, yeah I mean every, everyone has their own different line on a graph and everyone's line is going to look different I'm going to share that with the team tomorrow. So there's no ups and downs. It's just part of it. <laughs> Make sure to get that on film. I'd love to yeah. see that. <laughs> <laughs> <Got it. laughs> uh, so you've also talked about how your biggest insecurity is that you ask yourself, will I be a better coach than I am a dad? Will I be a better coach than I am a husband? But you say that those questions and those insecurities kind of drive you to be better and sort of not answering that question as yes. And I also found a tweet of yours from, I think it was over a decade now where you said, you'll always be known as a loser in life if you don't win with your family first. And I'm a big believer that some of our biggest motivations aren't to become the person that we want to be, but it's also trying to get as far away from the person that we don't want to be. Um, so what advice do you have for using sort of like insecurities like that as a tool to people's advantage rather than sometimes just being weighed down by things like that. Well, first of all, that's another great quote I'm probably going to use. <laughs> Not to get close to the person you want to be, get farther away from the person you don't want to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always 
I've always thought like, look, look, my job takes a lot of my time. It takes a lot of my energy. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of coaching, a lot of everything, psychology, you name it. Um, you're mentally drained when you go home. I mean, you wake up at three some days and you work out at four and you get going at six and then you're not done till noon and then holy smokes, you haven't eaten that much. And then like, you're just going on fumes a lot of the time. And that does impact your family. Like, you know, and they don't want to hear that, you know, you're home, like, let's go. So I just feel like this is, this is something that I still have to work on. Like I still have to focus on, but because it is an insecurity of mine and it keeps coming back to my mind, I, I try to not let it happen. You know, I'm aware of it. So how can I help is one of the biggest questions anyone can ask themselves all the time. It doesn't matter if you're in your job, home, wherever, how can I help? <laughs> I'm promising you that's going to help you. If you ask that question to yourself, how can I help? That's going to help. So it's just something I try to remind myself every day, but I'm still, I'm still trying to get better at it. hundred percent. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like I used to be this way when I was younger, where I would kind of have a fear of insecurities and kind of just block myself off from them and not even try to like think about it or say or feel like all right how can I use this to my advantage because I was just so scared of it but like you were saying is those can become some of your best strengths or some of your best tools to use in your life as a benefit yeah um so the last question that I have for you is you've said that at the end of the day we're all going to be defined by one sentence um and I believe that as well what do you think or what do you want your last sentence to be when people remember Luke Corrala? Man, you got some good ones. Uh, so that, that concept I got from John Maxwell and it hit me forever. And, um, oh man, my sentence, it, you know, hopefully would be, he was a, he was a great person that cared a lot about his family, would have done anything for them and tried the absolute best to do a great job with the platform that he had to help people. Lou, I think with the work that you're doing and the messages that you spread on a daily basis, I think you may have a few sentences coming your way at the end of your life. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe a full book. You yeah. already have, you already have a book. Maybe, maybe somebody else writing a book on you one day. It's just, it's, it's just, uh, I appreciate you saying that. And, like to encourage anyone else listening this book didn't just come out you know what i mean it it, it took six years to write and yeah. it was my, it was my hobby like it was it was who i was it was nothing out of the ordinary for me it was what i love to do and when that becomes like part of your purpose and part of your passion um i believe that's when it starts to help people like your consistency your belief and just continuing with it and you know it, it could rub people the wrong way it could do certain things it could whatever but like I didn't do it for that I didn't do it for those people to not approve I did it for like the person that I needed it the most at the right time and I did it for the the players that I was coaching that maybe not all of them heard it that day but that one couldn't have asked for more in that moment um, and then just to to just, you know, it's all part of the legacy thing, right? You just try to do good with what you have and whoever appreciates it's great. And whoever didn't, I'm sorry, but it wasn't for you, buddy. 100%. Did you ever have the thought of writing the book beforehand or was it kind of just a natural process that came along? Yeah, six years ago, I wanted to write it. Or maybe oh, eight. Wow. Yep. Wow. It kind of transformed. It started as like the no talent code where it was going to be a chapter book of just topics that I believe take no talent to be really good at. And then as I kept writing, I'm like, man, these are kind of like segmented into like nuggets. And I should just make a daily, a daily message for everyone. So like it evolved into that and I had the date on every message. So I got rid of that because I didn't want anyone to feel pressure to not have to read this, that or that when they get it and just number it. And that doesn't matter what day you read what just pick there's no order That's so awesome. i think that was the most valuable way to do it and then ask questions at the end of everything 
Yeah, I mean, I, I've read the entire book, and going back to that James Clear quote, you know, it's definitely a timeless book, and I think it could be something you never know 100 years from now when we're both not on this planet that people are still reading. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Lou, I appreciate you coming on The Outworker. Well, thanks for having me, man. Keep doing your thing. You're doing great. Appreciate it.